What technologies and concepts will help make Industry 4.0 a reality? IoT, AI, Edge AI, Gen AI, UNS are some of the many topics we discuss with Christophe Cremont, Solutions Architect, breathing and leaving industrial IoT on a daily basis. Christophe will share a very concrete and realistic scenario that illustrates how the combination of all these modern technologies can help empower factory floor operators, as well as business teams, by unifying, contextualizing and democratizing data from the edge all the way up to the cloud. Christophe was, will also demo an interesting and relevant use case for Gen AI in industrial automation. So are you ready to talk to your factory floor equipment and assets? Let's see how this all can be done in this new episode of the IoT Show. And remember to like and comment to share your perspective or ask questions and subscribe to the channel for more IoT and AI content. Everyone, this is Olivier. This is the IoT Show. Thanks for watching. Today we'll talk Industry 4.0 once again. And for that, we have Christophe with us. Hey, Christophe, how are you? Hi, Olivier. Thank you for having me today. I'm good. Thanks. So if my voice sounds like I'm an old radio you know, uh, host, it's because I have a cold. Sorry for that. I might cough and things like that. I apologize in advance. Um, so Christophe, where are you calling from? So uh, I'm calling from uh, Paris. I'm based in, uh, in Paris. Um, in my role, I'm a senior pre-sales solution architect at Avanade. Okay. Um, so Avanade is a joint venture between uh, Microsoft and Accenture, created in uh, 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and I lead uh, our Industry X practice across France, Belgium, and Netherlands. Uh, right. Industry X stands for uh, Industry of the Future. So tell me, how did you get to that position and job? How long have you been doing that and what have you done before that? Uh, so I'm at Avanade since uh, October 2015, so almost uh, nine years now. Uh, and I'm in the industrial IoT world uh, since uh, November 2019. Okay, so suffice to say, you've seen many customers, you've seen many industrial, uh, mostly in Europe, I would assume? Mostly in Europe, yes, exactly. Gotcha. Okay, so you have an idea of what Industry 4.0 is about, but I would like for you to give us your definition of what Industry 4.0 is. Yes, yeah, so uh, to give a bit of uh, maybe history, uh, we, I, I will talk about uh, industrial revolutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, we are in the first one, uh, industrial revolution, Industry 4.0. Uh, the first one was more on uh, introduction of water power and steam engines. So it's a long time ago. Uh, mechanized manufacturing, but uh, before the electricity. Uh, electricity has come in rev uh, Industrial Revolution 2.0. So it's more uh, what we can call the mass assembly line, uh, mass production techniques, pioneered by uh, Henry Ford. Uh, then we have the third one, the Industry 3.0, uh, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. Industry 3.0. Uh, and we shift from mechanical to uh, digital technology. So uh, we see appearing more and more electronic devices, but it's not yet the, the power of computers and uh, what we know uh, today. So today we are in the fourth industrial revolution uh, where the computing technologies, uh, cloud computing as well, uh, are helping uh, frontline workers in the shop floor uh, to, to operate. So we are in the, in the first one. Uh, and what we see more and more from, from our customers is uh, that they are trying to digitalize their oper uh, operations. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a term that I like is a uh, digital. Uh, so ne they need to link the physical assets with the digital world uh, to help uh, produce better, uh, reduce the energy consumptions. So it's better for the planet uh, mm -hmm. and also to empower their uh, employees. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. That's a good definition. I think it does align with many definitions we're hearing out there. Um, and, and is it like fair to say it's, it's about the data, right? It's about contextualizing these environment, these machines and so on, extracting the data, analyzing it, and then making business decisions based on these insights. 
Exactly. Contextualizing the data is the, the first um, challenge we have to face. Yeah. And there is also the closed loop, if I can say, between the edge and the, cl and the cloud. Okay. The edge is in the factory and the cloud, we, the cloud will have the, the power, the compute, the compute power, will have the, the ability to train models, for example. So mm -hmm. there is a synergy uh, be between the two worlds and it's very important for a, a customer to know where the data sits. Is it in the factory or in the cloud or both at the same time? We have been talking about Industry 4.0 for some time. We heard about it. The term has been, you know, hype at some point, and, and it's now in our vocabulary and we're using it a lot. And it's been some time. But and, and we're seeing traction in the industry. And I see I was looking for some numbers to try and identify how many factories in Europe or in the US are now digitalized or have adopted some level of digital technologies. And it seems like over a half of the existing manufacturing uh, firms are are adopting or have adopted some form of digital technologies, such as AI, IoT, um, advanced robotics, but it's still notoriously difficult to scale up, especially across uh, you know factory networks and so on. What's your take on this? Do you see that progress? Do you see digital digitalization happening uh, out there in the field, or is it still something that is kind of rare? I see more and more uh, often customers trying to digitalize their operations um, be because of the adoption of cloud technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, what is uh, slowing down this process, if I can say, um, is the ability to understand um, the completeness, the vision uh, with the cloud, with the use of the cloud. Uh, you know that there are a lot of intellectual properties that they have to protect. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't want the recipe of a specific uh, magic formula, for example, to manufacture, uh, uh, to, to, to build uh, tires, let's say. Um, and so we, we have to um, help customers understand and adopt cloud technologies to help them uh, share the data across the organization because the main challenge is data is siloed. Even if data is connected, we can say that we have some lines, machines connected to computers, basically. Uh, but we need this data to be shared across the organization and not only uh, be able to look at the data when you are in the factory physically in front of a, a computer or a screen. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, what is um, uh, um, slowing the process of adoption, if I can say, uh, because the customers need to know basically what is the data that they have to put in the cloud and they have to keep at the edge. Yeah. Uh, and this is where we, we help them with uh, advisory teams on the value proposition to implement such solution in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and we see also the software editors that are more and more mature on the technologies that they are able to deploy at edge was not the case in the previous years, previous okay. let's say, five years. So now it's more and more uh, mature uh, in order to process data where you have a machine, for example, that is sending uh, millions of messages uh, a minute. You have to handle the, the data and contextualize in, uh, in real time. Gotcha. So if I were to try and summarize what you just said, it seems like you, you have, you're still battling to explain the value prop proposition of digitalization. I would assume, especially to OT people, to people in operations, you are also battling in having them on the OT side, bridging that gap with IT and share the data so that it's available for business people or for IT people. Right. And, um, something you didn't mention as well. So, these kind of adoption of technical uh, or of digital technology, sorry, requires budgets. And, and usually in that world where there is still a divide between OT and IT, like where is the budget sitting from your experience? Exactly. This is a good point. Uh, and, and the dream, I think, is uh, to have a, a convergence of OT and IT, so op operational technology and information technology. Uh, because what we see is that the problems on the shop floor in the factory uh, has, have to be tackled by people that are operators, uh, that are um, uh, 
uh, handling big machines, big, big equipment. So they need to uh, to improve the process of uh, production from from their machines. Um, but the budget is in the IT side. So the IT is information technology, it's more, mm -hmm. if I can say, modern workplace. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we we have to um, to have a bridge in terms of vision of what can be accomplished if we are better in OT, in digitalizing the operations, so that the IT people uh, who have the budget <laughs> will help OT people uh, implement the solutions. And at the same time, uh, to not worry people on the OT side on what we will implement, uh, to be sure that it's not only a POC mm -hmm. that is somewhere in the factory, um, but we need the user adoption. We need the OT people to know uh, what is the value of the digital uh, applications that will uh, mm -hmm. will uh, deploy and uh, to embark them on the journey so that they are uh, empowered uh, with the technology and they know exactly uh, how it will work in uh, in the in the factory that makes sense so try and convince ot folks that digital technology is not evil and that they can use it take advantage of it uh, and that will help them collaborate with the business yeah. side of the story awesome from the pure technology perspective, and once again, based on your experience with all the customers you're working on, what are the, the elements? We talked about contextualization of um, of data. Um, what are the main things that you think are, are necessary or happening um, that will help digitalizing factories and other industrial um, assets and 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 uh, equipments and and you know locations? What are the technologies? And what are the features that you think are important to focus on? There is one concept that, that is emerging more and more today that is called the unified namespace or UNS. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to contextualize the data from the, I would say, from the equipment that is sending telemetry. As an example, if I send conveyor uh, belt speed in meter per second, and I have only the serial ID or the serial number of the machine, Mm -hmm. I'm not able to know as an operator or when I'm using the digital application, what is this machine? Is it linked to uh, a line, assembly line, production line? Where is it? Is it in Mexico, in USA? I don't know, in France. Mm -hmm. And so the unified space is the first step to be able to, uh, using the ISA 95 standard, to contextualize the data in a hierarchical way so that you know that the equipment is attached to uh, a line attached to an area. So let's say a car manufacturer, you have a painting area and mm -hmm. multiple lines. And uh, you, you know exactly the machine is in a specific site in uh, in USA or in Europe so that you will reduce the time for the diagnostic when there is an issue. Since the message you are receiving, you know exactly what is the machine and what is the role of the machine that is sending this me this message. And on top of that, you will be able to uh, share the data across many applications, can be MES, ERP, other applications, without creating all the pipelines and all the plumbing, if I can say, because we are uh, all plumbers in this, uh, yeah. in this domain. So when you will change an application, you will not have the need to change the UNS itself. It will be a hub, a data hub, and you, you are subscribing to topics on this hub that are for you very important. So let's say as an example, you want to send alert to an application when there is a shutdown of a machine in a factory. When you are relying on a UNS, you have a hub exposing the data to all applications and data will only subscribe to the alert topic, for example. You don't need to create all the plumbing with APIs, version of APIs, and new software editors that are decommissioning features and so on. You just have a hub of messages, application are subscribing to it, and then they are taking the responsibility to relay the message or the information, create a ticket, uh, for example. So this is a, a concept mm -hmm. that is emerging, and it will simplify all the data that is coming in the cloud because the volume is very huge when you have a, as I said, a, a machine sending 1 million messages a minute, uh, you need to know who is talking, basically. So this is very important to have such uh, uh, such technologies. And from what you describe, I can see how, you know, the notion of hub will unify the data, right, coming from different assets, different equipments, and so on. 
I think we'll contextualize that. As you were saying, the machine might not know itself that it's a conveyor belt on this kind of mounting lane or assembly lane, whatever. Um, and and then you have this notion of democratizing data that you mentioned while we're discussing and preparing for the show, uh, where you um, you were basically saying that it's really important that the data becomes available not just to the operator who, is, who will visualize that and has the knowledge of the machine and the meaning of the data, but also that this data is made available with meaning to the business side of the of the company, right? Exactly, because you can have many KPIs on the OT side and not the same in the stakeholder vision, if I can say. For example, mm -hmm. an operator will look at the downtime of a machine to reduce the downtime to be sure that it's 100% producing uh, stuff, mm -hmm. uh, if I can say. And, and the stakeholder will look at uh, what is the speed of the, of the factory and be able, and being able to compare factories. Let's say you are, again, a car manufacturer, you want to produce at a very big speed and you, you want to compare if uh, the new factory you are building or let's say you are manufacturing batteries, you want to, to see if your giga factory is scaling so that you are able to adapt to the demand uh, of people buying electrical vehicles in this uh, example. There is still today a problem of interoperability. Different manufacturers are producing different types of assets, devices, talking different protocols and languages, exposing data in different formats, sometimes different units. Do you think UNS will help resolve that interoperability problem that exists today? Not exactly. <laughs> Not okay. at 100% because you will still have at the edge industrial protocols that you have to connect to because yeah. the machines, you, you are not able to change all the machines for, for it to, to make it uh, work. But at some point, it will simplify the process of the basic question, where is the data? Uh, because data is siloted into many, many different protocols. You know, there is no standard or when there is too much standard, we cannot say that there is one standard. So it's an yeah. issue. And so you, you have the complexity of each manufacturer having developed a way for the machine to talk, if I can say. Mm -hmm. And so it's yeah. not homogeneous. A machine can send, for example, uh, what we can call a tag uh, for the temperature and manufacturer said that temperature will be T underscore. Okay, but another manufacturer, it's temp, and another is uh, temperature. So with the unified name space, what you will be able to, to, to see is that all the data is flowing into it in mm -hmm. a normalized way so that you are able to, to compare, for example, uh, the temperature of a machine uh, with a specific manufacturer with a, the temperature of another machine with a specific manufacturer so that you, you will not have the complexity of mapping and using Excel worksheet to map uh, the, the, the column names. And it's yeah. a big, big uh, challenge for uh, industrial uh, industry in this industry because when you, you are buying new equipments and at the same time you have machines that are in the 1970s, you cannot call back the manufacturer to change the way the machine is sending the data. So yeah, that's why you, that you have sense. to contextualize it. That makes perfect sense. Um, and I, I'm seeing a lot of um, work around UNS as a concept, around the standards around it, around the various, what I would call connectors, right? Because like inbound data coming from different field bosses and different protocols. And then there's some, some rallying around MQTT certainly as a pop sub mechanism for sharing the data, but, but is it right to say UNS is more of a concept as in there, there will be different types of implementations out there. It's not going to be something that is like UNS is not a product. It's a concept that the, the industry is trying to rally around. Exactly. It's a, it's a concept. It's not a product, but it's like describing the best way to build a house and to describe each piece of the, mm -hmm. the house you are building, but it's not building the house itself. You, you have to understand what is the data you want to use. Basically, you don't need to send all the data of all your industrial equipments in the, in the cloud. You, you can also select, of course, what, what you want to manage as a data. It's more a concept of simplifying the applications on top of the data. Okay. You, you know Excellent. that all the data is in one place and this place as you said, there is the MQTT broker that is more used today to use uh, the publish subscribe method uh, mm -hmm. in it. And, and the UNS is, uh, yeah, you build it and 
you, you can build all your applications on top of it and the data sits in one place, not in many, many uh, databases to, uh, to query. So Christophe, you had, um, uh, you had a demo, like a concrete example of all of that in place. You already shared a lot of details here because you're passionate. We can see that. Um, let's go through that demo like step by step and um, tell us what we're looking at. So for this demo, I'm a car manufacturer. And at the same time, I'm also producing batteries because I'm selling electrical vehicles. The challenge we have with uh, such scenario is that every equipment is sending uh, its own data. So when you are producing a battery, you will not have the same machines that the ones that are building the cars, <laughs> for sure. And what I try to achieve here and to explain is how to contextualize the data that is coming from various equipments at scale. And so a lot, a lot of data that is coming in the, in the, at the edge to be processed at the edge and then processed in the cloud. So what I will explain is the concept of ISA 95, as I said, is the hierarchy. So as you can see here, the enterprise, the site, the area, the line and the cell. So this is to explain that a specific equipment sending telemetry, I know that is position on a specific line in, in Germany, for example. And on top of that, I will explain how can we achieve the data processing at edge with the data processing in the cloud and to reduce the complexity to access the data because we don't have uh, every time uh, a database administrator in a factory <laughs> and we don't know exactly where is the data in each uh, table, database and so on. I've created a conversational agent based on a generative AI using generative AI that will simplify the process for me. So it will look at the data, where is the data and do the queries for me so that I don't need to, to write the queries by myself and to retrieve the results so that it will simplify, for example, the diagnosis, the diagnosis time for an operator, or let's say an operator that has the need to call someone in the factory, you know that the directory will be group-wide and not factory-wide. The application that is running the directory is at the group level and not at the factory level. So mm -hmm. you are able to, to map different uh, type of data and extract the data. And with the confer conversational agent, being able to ask a simple question and have the results. So before this, I will specify the typical solution overview when we are doing this. So basically, you will start with the industrial assets that are in your factories, and you will have two data planes. So the data planes is where the data will be processed, contextualized, and where it will be more and more smarter, if I can say. You will be able to understand what is running in, as your operations. Uh, so you will have one edge data plane, and we'll have also one cloud data plane so that there is a complementarity between the two. And there is, a, as I said in the beginning, kind of a closed loop between what we are, you, are, you are able to process at the edge and what you are able to process in the cloud. Let's say you have ERP that can be SAP. It will be in the cloud and not at the edge. You will not have one instance of SAP for each factory. It will be more in the cloud as we, we see today. So. At the edge, you will have the, the edge data plane. You will have also workloads. So you can have applications for the visualization of your data, for, for your time series database running uh, at the edge. And we see that Kubernetes today is the to go for the industrial uh, companies because it's very robust, scalable, and you can uh, easily uh, deploy containers at the edge the same way you are doing it in the cloud. Yeah, I think Christophe, there's there's something I want to to bring up here. Lots of the people in the audience are coming from the embedded world, and so they know really well that world of the assets, the equipments, right? And very often when we talk about bringing or using Kubernetes uh, at the edge, we're talking about industrial infrastructure. We're talking about maybe a rack of server or a huge big gateway, right? So it's not an embedded device. That's why we call that edge. But that's something that is more and more common in these kind of scenarios to bring that heavier compute and storage unit or set of units 
that will support Kubernetes technologies and you know uh, features of Kubernetes where we can manage from the cloud, where you can have redundancy from both the hardware and software perspective. You can have containerization of your workloads. You can bring AI down there. So it's something that is super important to 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 precise here to talk edge where Kubernetes runs is really more about rack of server on premises rather than embedded technologies, right? This is where, where there are different sizes, I would say, of edge, uh, mm -hmm. if, if you will. And the, the, the embedded one that would call that, I don't know, I don't I hate the term like tiny edge or, or micro edge, whatever I heard, like all of them, but it's, it's embedded. And then you have the heavier edge, which is these rack of servers, these huge gateways that will be able to run Kubernetes and support this notion of containerization that it offers, right? Yeah, exactly. It's more the EV edge, even if uh, we don't use uh, GPUs in the factory, we'll use them in the cloud because it's uh, less costly. So you don't have to buy a new uh, graphic cards uh, every time. But yeah, it's more EV edge or uh, medium edge. And that's interesting what you just said as well. So working with industrial, especially in manufacturing, you have to deal with an existing, there's a brownfield, there's not just the assets, but there's also eventually some like PLCs and then there's like servers that are like pieces of hardware that you might not be able to upgrade with GPUs and NPUs, whatever. Uh, and you have to work with what you have very often in that domain. So you have to think about where will what run at the edge versus the cloud and so forth. Also based on that factor of what's the hardware available on site, on premise in my infrastructure right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we see that some customers don't have necessarily a data center in the factory. So they mm -hmm. can rely also on uh, industrial PCs. But if you want uh, resiliency, failover and so on, you know that if someone is shutting down the industrial PC, <laughs> you will lose uh, everything. So that's why Kubernetes is the best uh, uh, gotcha. solution to use. Okay, makes sense. And in the cloud, it will be more in terms of um, on data processing. Uh, you will be able to match data that is only in the cloud with data coming from the edge and also store data for a long time or a long period. You know that when you need to train an AI model, you cannot train it on every message received every second. You need to store the data for, let's say, one week. And on one week, you will be able to, to train the model to see if he's able to recognize an anomaly. Mm -hmm. And the best would be to capture the anomaly during the, this process. So mm -hmm. you have the data in the cloud where there is the anomaly and you, you are able to train the data to recognize the, the anomaly. So that's why you need both because in terms of storage also, you cannot store all the data all the time at the edge forever. So you will be able to offload uh, the data to the cloud and then to, to build uh, cloud applications. Um, I have a Microsoft implementation of this solution. As I'm working at Avanade, uh, we are uh, integrating Microsoft uh, technologies for our customers. And so specifically for the manufacturing area, Microsoft has developed a solution at the edge that is called uh, Azure IoT Operations. Uh, so that you will have the edge data plane uh, with uh, Azure IoT versions, being able to process the data, to query uh, if you, you need to have a reference data store at edge, for example. And in the cloud, the focus today is on Fabric. So Microsoft Fabric is the one-stop data platform for everyone. Basically, it will unify uh, different types of uh, personas, meaning the data engineers, the data scientists, the business analyst will be on the same platform uh, working on the same data. Previously, you, you had to, to go to multiple experiences, different applications, different types of experiences. And now today you are able to, to see your data flowing into Fabric. You have the data engineer that is able to create the, the pipelines for the transformation. Mm -hmm. You have the data scientist that is using the data to train models and then the force here is to be able to train the model in the cloud, compile it or build it as a Docker container, and then run at the edge. So that at the edge, you will have the what we call the inference, mm -hmm. and it will reduce the latency. If you need to have a real-time scenario, everything is running at the edge. You can cut the internet link if you want, and you will be able to continue the processing of the data at the edge. So this is very... Yeah. 
very important to 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 mention and certainly um, certainly appealing for ot people who are not super keen on having all their secret sauce you were talking or recipes being shared with a pub on the public cloud or over the internet exactly this is one very important topic and important point to to mention we see that intellectual property from customers with as you said the secret recipe they don't want everything to be in the cloud so that's why we are able to have the ingredients if i can say at the edge mm -hmm. and the recipe in the cloud so that everything is protected it's only in the at the edge for the for the ingredients the secret sauce mm -hmm. uh, and in the cloud you you have the the recipe but you, you need to have both to create a, a beautiful product so that's why we we need to implement such solutions mm -hmm. and also in terms of cyber security to be very robust on what you are authorizing edge to cloud and cloud to edge. And so that's yeah. why Kubernetes is also very strong in that case. As you may know, uh, it takes uh, five minutes to install Kubernetes and it takes one week to, to configure the network. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you are able to secure everything uh, at this yeah. stage. <laughs> that, that's a good one. Um, and another aspect of this, um, not fight, but the gap that is being filled in between IT and OT is that this Kubernetes infrastructure at the edge can now be managed by the IT team because that's something to know. This is cloud technology. This is like just managing just managing another server with workloads. And you have Azure Arc in the case of Microsoft technology. It allows you to do that, um, you know, across infrastructure, across hybrid infrastructure between clouds and between cloud and edge. And, and that's something that's becoming you know, illustrative of how IT is starting to come and not taking over, but you're starting to bring cloud and IT technologies at the edge to to empower OT, right? Yeah, exactly. I love this uh, concept of a single pane of glass where you are able to to control as uh, using the control plane mm -hmm. all the machines in the IT world and in the OT world because we know that. Previously, we were talking about OT people and IT people. You know that IT people, in terms of cybersecurity, have to react really fast for the vulnerabilities. Uh, and now they have the ability to, to have the transparency and to see what is running in terms of edge implementation in the factories, in the operations, and to see if everything is patched, basically. So this is improving the convergence of IT and OT. Because no IT people knows what is running on the OT side. Uh, yeah. It's not a black box or it's not shadow OT. I don't know if it exists. Shadow OT, shadow IT exists, but shadow OT was the concept of having machines that has never seen internet. We are using old technologies like Windows XP and with a uh, very low uh, level of security. So now you, you are bringing and expanding the high level of security of the cloud mm -hmm. at the edge at the same time. Yep. And the second thing I want to mention in this, uh, in this uh, demo, the different types of assets you will be able to connect to and you will have to connect to. So as you said, convergence IT-OT, you have IT management of OT resources, but you, you need to separate the OT technologies with specific people from the operational technology side. Meaning this one with the assets you can see on the lower left here, you have the assets, you have the OPC UA servers. OPC UA is now uh, a protocol that you are, we are seeing more and more often in, uh, in factories to connect assets, industrial equipments. And you, you can see in the middle that people from the IT are able to manage a cluster that is running in the factory. So this is uh, reducing the gap between IT and OT people because we are able now to say uh, what are the equipments that you want to act on and what, uh, what are the equipments where you want the data to, to go to the cloud, basically. Let's say you want to create a, a report dashboard. Uh, you need to know what are the machines and what are the information from those machines you want to retrieve. So it will create a discussion <laughs> between IT people managing Kubernetes server and OT people that are able to understand and is industrial equipment or is it running and so on. And so this part, so the Azure IoT operations as I was mentioning before, is very important because it allows us to, to have connectors. We can call them southbound connectors. So 
to the shop floor, industrial mm -hmm. equipments, and at the same time, northbound connectors to the cloud, so that you are able to, to have a message sent to the cloud from a machine that has never known internet, that was not connected, and you are a box in the middle that is secured, that is managed by the IT, and so you are very confident on what you are processing in terms of data, and you are able to know exactly what is going in the cloud, and you, uh, of course, you can select what you would send in the, in the cloud. So from the data processing part now, as I mentioned, you have a lot, a lot, a lot of data uh, that is coming from the industrial equipment, uh, and you need to know uh, what are the meaningful data you want to retrieve and send in the cloud. You will not send everything. Some clients choose to send everything, but uh, as you may know, when you send data in the cloud, you will have to pay for the network and from the, the storage. Yeah. So for a POC, MVP, it's okay because you have to uh, experiment uh, things. But when you know exactly for a KPI that you need to have five values or 15 values to, to calculate, to create a KPI, as an example, the OEE, overall equipment effectiveness, you have to know the performance of the machine. So if, is the machine running at speed 100%? The availability, there is no downtime, machine is running. And the quality of the pieces that are being produced. Mm -hmm. The three factors you will have to map with the data from the machine. And what I see from customers in manufacturing can be uh, automotive, aerospace. You, we, we see that around 50 tags, I would say, is enough to calculate a KPI. You don't need to send 1,000 tags of data and nobody will read <laughs> at the yeah. information. So you will be able to do it with this, uh, this component. So what Azure IoT Operations is uh, bringing is the ability to process the data at the edge and to select what you want to, to send in the cloud or not. And at the same time, to be able to enrich the data. So in this scenario, I, I am a car manufacturer of electrical vehicles. I'm also manufacturing batteries. And so here I will have some data that is at the edge, so in the factory, that can be a, the database, MES is a manufacturing execution system, mm -hmm. where you know, for example, what are the products you are producing, what are the operators that are in the factory, and you know that there are shifts because people cannot work <laughs> 24 hours a day. Uh, they need to, to sleep, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so you will need to know when there is a, a changeover with the new operator working on this machine, and so that you will be able to call the right person if there is an issue on the machine, and you, you need to have a shutdown of the machine, for example. So in this scenario, uh, data is enriched at the edge with data that is only available at the edge. So the, as I said, the MES, Manufacturing Execution System, then the data is sent in the cloud using a, a cloud connector. And in the cloud, I will be able also to enrich the data with data that is only available in the cloud. So it will be more an ERP or a directory where, where you will have the phone number of the operator, the email address that is group-wide and not factory specific. You, you will have a, an application for all the group with the directory, with all the people working in, in the company. And for the maintenance, you will have, for example, the maintenance contracts. What is the new maintenance date of this equipment? And what is the serial number? And using this scenario, I will be able to match data at the edge with data in the cloud. And using the what we can call the factory agent, being able to ask questions in a natural language and have responses without having the burden of creating the queries to extract the data. Because sometimes it can be challenging and you will see uh, in the example, some queries are very complicated. <laughs> yeah, and we were talking about, you know, one of the aspects of helping digitalization was democratizing data and the insights that are extracted from it, right? And, and, and that gap between OT and IT, part of it is the complexity of managing databases and creating queries to access the data and so on. And it seems, and we'll talk a little bit more after the demo about that, but Gen AI seems to be a great tool for helping that democratization of data across the two worlds of OT and IT. Yeah, and to empower employees with the new digital applications so yeah. that they, for example, they can bring us questions 
and then we are, we are able to create a template as a, mm -hmm. a copilot, factory copilot that is specific to their needs so that they don't have to, to create complex questions. We can also mm -hmm. uh, create them for uh, in advance. So in terms of data structure, basically what I created here is uh, what we call the medallion architecture. So medallion architecture is when you want to refine the data from the raw data to data that has been enriched at the edge and then in the cloud so that you are able to contextualize iteratively data coming from your equipments mm -hmm. uh, and you will be able to, to have information that were not in the original message here on the left and that you can enrich and on the right with the plus signs I put here. You see, for example, the ISA 95 standard I was mentioning with the enterprise site, area, line and cell. And also the operator name and the products I am manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the data is not in the original message. You, you have to extract from other databases. And here the component, the data processor allows us to enrich the data so that you will have the full uh, information in the message. And to be uh, complete in this demo, we'll have the same in the cloud. And as I said, uh, in the cloud, you will have, a, you will have the uh, ability to put the operator phone, operator email, uh, maintenance date, maintenance status of the equipment that was not in the original message, but only in some systems that are sitting in the cloud. So this will facilitate having the information in one shot, if I can say, instead of having multiple applications, multiple databases, multiple ways of querying the databases, you will just have to ask a question and uh, the agent will be able to build the queries based on this uh, data that has been uh, contextualized. Okay. So the cloud, the cloud will have the gold records. And so it's the contextualized data that was coming from the factory. Sounds good. And for the conversational agent using generative AI, I'm using a semantic kernel. So the semantic kernel is the way to map developer code, uh, can be Python, can be C Sharp, Java, with a model, with an open AI model, or uh, can be Mistral or uh, Llama, whatever. But it will be able to map the application that I'm building with my backend, my front end, with the intelligence in the cloud that is able to understand my query. And so to have a flow, a natural flow in terms of conversation where I have a prompt, I have the model that is uh, thinking, and mm -hmm. then I have the response. So I will show you the demo right now. Yeah, let's look at that. So I called the demo, talk to your factory, because this is what basically we'll do. So in this scenario, what I created is the ability to ask questions in a natural language and have the results uh, coming in my uh, in my interface. So I have some example questions. Let's say I want to know what are the different products you are manufacturing. I want to know the names of those products and also the sites. Yeah. So, so question. Me, Christophe, yeah. who would be that persona doing like interacting with uh, that interface here? Who would be the person? Uh, doing that an operator on the factory floor is it going to be a factory manager is it going to be someone on the business side of things like a salesperson like the ceo cto of the company for this demo it will be more an operator in the factory or it okay. can be also a, a quality uh, director in the factory okay. sorry for that it can be a, a quality director but that needs to know uh, what's up what is happening in the factory exactly okay we can have another scenario for sea uh, levels where you can create graphs and dashboards and where the data is less operational but more based on kpis here the <laughs> it's more here uh, focused on uh, operators in the factory that will use the application but that there are no they are not uh, database engineers or database administrators so okay. we have to help okay. them uh, find the uh, find the data that makes sense so as an example i can have the the different products we are manufacturing what are the the names of the products and the sites where we are manufacturing them and when i'm sending the data the the questions so the the model will uh, create the query and retrieve the results so 
as you may remember in the this uh, demo i was mentioning here that we have several lines and several sites mm -hmm. and what the the conversational agent based on genai will do is creating the query a complex can be complex query and retrieve the results so if it's not wrong we have uh, a car in uh, germany model one model two in austin a truck in buffalo and a battery in shanghai so a car in germany berlin a truck in buffalo a battery in shanghai and model two in austin so okay my model is not uh, hallucinating <laughs> 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 and the query that was sent is kind of a simple query here but you see that if i was a uh, database engineer i had to to do this query so i would just show you another example where the query is more complex and i mm -hmm. want to calculate at the same time things that are in my factory so i want to calculate the yield for each site today based on the total units produced and the good units produced because i have in the system i know when the parts are good or not when it's not the case we can call them scrap parts and so we are not able to sell them to a customer because the parts are, are scrapped so i want to calculate the yield and for that you will see that there is calculation with percentage and so on with different uh, information and i have the yield in less than one second and i'm using gpt 4 for this uh, for this example okay. and i see that if i was doing this manually with uh, with the query we see that the query here is more and more complex mm -hmm. so Again, the goal here is not to put the technology to replace a human by a robot. We are not in a Terminator. Uh, but the goal here is to uh, simplify the process for a human accessing the data and at the same time asking the question in a natural language. So that it's I can, for you. I can definitely see, you know, a scenario in the past where someone from operations would have to collaborate with someone from IT and tell them, hey, what the, here is the information I need. Like, and the IT person will say, okay, I'm going to create a query for you. Create the query, get the results, and the operator guy will be like, oh, wait a second, it's not exactly what I wanted or needed, so can you actually add this and that? And well, you cycle uh, with, with people building these queries. Now you are basically interacting as an operator with that Gen AI that will react to in a natural way what the operator is asking in once so it's something way more dynamic than rather than having a set of predefined queries that the operator has to pick from uh, and in the example you're showing prompts that are already you know pre-populated but that's something that an operator would, could change the phrasing could change the angle of you know his conversation with the ai uh, to get to that result uh, and that's, uh, you know, as you were saying, augmenting people rather than replacing them. Yeah, exactly. And as you said previously, we had to export the data, having the, the right dump of data, mm -hmm. uh, then having the right query. Then, uh, as you said, there is a uh, coming back and forth to the people extracting the data before having those results. And now it's more, yeah, it's a natu natural language. And there is another scenario that can be interesting also is uh, when you need to, uh, for example, to restart a machine, but the um, instructions to do it is in German, let's say, or in, in uh, <laughs> and you are, you are uh, a French guy yeah. <laughs> or woman, uh, you are not understanding exactly what to do. You can also ask the intelligent agent to, to parse the documentation, to give you only bullet points on what you have to do and in your mm -hmm. uh, natural language in French, Chinese, it depends. So this is very useful for people to interact with the technology, but at the same time, uh, resolve uh, very simple problems that were very complex in the past to, to translate all the documentation yeah. from the industrial uh, manufacturers. Yeah, and is it fair to say that this is possible because the data has been <clears throat> fed in a unified contextualized way, right? So the, the notion of transforming the data 
from the bronze to silver, enriching it after you had unified it with some UNS. Now you're switching from silver to gold by once again enhancing or enriching the data with business information or ERPs or you know your employees information or not, or sometimes customer um, data you know from your CRM. And, and then you can implement very rich query through that Gen AI tool to extract a lot of information, whether you're an operator or anyone all the way up to the, uh, you know, CX, um, you know, group of people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Once the data has been contextualized and generally available, if I can say, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you, can build, uh, you can build on top of it. Without the contextualization, you, you have to use multiple applications, multiple databases and so on to have the same results mm -hmm. and doing uh, joint queries everywhere uh, to map the, the results. Yep, fantastic. Okay, Christophe, so we have that information out of that Gen AI, but that's not always the way an operator needs or wants to see it, right? So visualization is also a critical aspect of dealing with the data and contextualizing it and democratizing it. So tell me a bit about visualization and the options that are available out there. Yeah, so for, for the visualization part, it's very important for the operator to have uh, the visualization of the operations at the edge. So it will be more on the time scale of one minute uh, real time, what is the machine doing and what is the heartbeat of the machine uh, in terms of telemetry can be pressure, humidity. And in the, in the cloud, it will be more in order to compare machines, compare lines, or even compare factories. Mm -hmm. And it will be more in the time scale of a minute to an hour or a day, because you need to have large amounts of data to compare uh, the performance of a, of a factory, and you cannot compare on a minute basis. It's not, mm -hmm. uh, it's not uh, the way we are doing. So using the same data, what's important is that you are able to build visualization applications on the same data. And again, since it's contextualized, it's very easy to compare one factory to another because the data will be described the same way. And to simplify what I'm doing, what, what I'm explaining here is the columns in a factory would be the same in another factory so that you are able to compare very easily a temperature, for example, from one factory to another or a number of uh, parts that have been produced uh, in Germany versus in, uh, in USA as the example here. Awesome. Awesome. And, and I see here you have many different examples of technology that can be used. You have Grafana. I, I think I recognize some Power BI things and so on. So you have options and that will definitely like from one company to another one, you know, depend where they want to use it, how you're using it, what kind of licenses they already have, but options are basically limitless here. Exactly. Yeah. And yep. everything is relying on the same data. That is the, <laughs> the magic, yep. if I can say. That definitely is the gist of it. So Christoph, that definitely gives us a lot of context about you know how UNS and digital technologies, AI, Gen AI can help go through that transformation of the industry to really land in that industry 4.0 world that we are all aiming at. A um, couple of like closing questions. So we, we already mentioned the fact that AI, Gen AI are technology that will augment humans versus replacing them. So you say we're not in a Terminator world, mm -hmm. definitely not. Um, and, and that's even more true for OT jobs, right? Because you were describing scenario where the OT person and their knowledge is key to really do something, right? So the AI itself will not be able to do the work of that OT person. Yeah, exactly. The, the first uh, factor of success for a project in uh, industrial IoT in general is the user adoption. We need to understand from the OT side why they are using or why, why they will use this application, this digital, the new digital application. Mm -hmm. They have the knowledge. They know the machine, how is it working? They know exactly 
how to replace a part. They know exactly how to stop and start uh, the machine. So we are not here to replace their jobs and to say there will be a Skynet implementation of what you are doing and everything is uh, automated. We mm -hmm. need to uh, understand how they are working, what they are doing in their uh, uh, daily tasks. And the idea is, uh, for example, there is an operator that is doing uh, the best calibration for a specific machine and is the best guy in the, in the factory in terms of automatizing the, the tasks that the machine has to do. Uh, we are able to capture this uh, knowledge and to apply this to another machine that was not completely well calibrated. And this is really interesting because we are not replacing the job of someone. We are just expanding the knowledge of someone to another machine. Mm -hmm. And so you, we are able to to have the recipe or the best recipe to calibrate the machine and to be able to do the same for all other, the other machines with the, the same calibration. And it can lead to uh, reducing energy consumptions. So it's good for the planet. It's not uh, to replace someone by a technology, it's for the technology to understand what is the best calibration and uh, what is the best settings uh, to, to apply. Yep. Fantastic. Um, many concepts, many topics, many discussions here. We did talk about a lot of things today. Um, there's this notion also of the need to have both edge and cloud compute and, and a certain level of um, ability or capabilities uh, across the board. Um, this notion of one pane of glass to manage all of that. You didn't dig too much into security in all that story, but there is a security story um, and we'll dig deeper in other chats and other conversation. I would actually would love to invite people to come and, and comment down there in the video or on our LinkedIn post that are related to this video because Christoph, you just gave us some level of information that feels like, okay, we did go in depth. But it's still scratching the surface of what's possible and the technology that are used and what they can achieve, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we see today that uh, we we use LLMs in the cloud, uh, mm -hmm. but now we see that uh, the tendency is more to uh, SLMs, so small language models, mm -hmm. uh, where you can have autonomous applications at the edge. Even the model itself is running at the edge without internet connectivity. Uh, and yeah. this is more and more uh, the new way of doing uh, things. Because I, as I said to a, to a client in a, in a call, uh, you, you don't need to know, for example, the full Wikipedia to restart a machine. So you can build a small language model that will be only knowledgeable for a specific set yeah. of instructions and you don't need to have the wikipedia <laughs> uh, full information in the in the model itself to resolve your your issues and so that you will also resolve the uh, the question of my data is uh, is training a model i don't want my data to be uh, used by any company uh, and using slms at the edge uh, everything is running at edge but you have to have the hardware to make it uh, run uh, faster. That, so that makes sense. There is, there is a... That makes sense. We're still talking kind of a heavier edge, but uh, we're, we're now talking about... Well, actually, there are some level of AI and, and um, you know, SLMs that can run on very on, on tinier devices and, and big mm -hmm. servers. So yes. that's sort of super interesting. Kind of a bummer that OT people will not be able to ask their AI, hey, can you act as a Jedi and then <laughs> tell me that, right? Or so, that's okay. That's okay. No, they want to be efficient. They want to deal with the machine, not with um, entity. But that's that's great. So, Christoph, thanks a lot. We'll try and invite people to come and, and engage here in the conversation. That was a very uh, interesting talk that you just like and, and topic you shared with us, uh, how UNS and digital technologies are helping getting to that industry 4.0 promise uh, and uh, and really evolve how people are working. That's a fascinating topic. Thanks a lot for your time today. Thank so. you, Olivier. Thank you, Olivier. Thanks, Thanks. all for tuning in. See you. Bye. Thanks.